Hello everyone and welcome to the video on building a ticker. I think the name of the video begs the question, what exactly is a ticker? Well, I define them as something with a clock escapement type mechanism in them, but they aren't really designed to tell time, such as this beast on the screen. I built this last year because I was so impressed by the work of David C. Roy and his sculpture named Monarch, and he uses a very similar mechanism in it. Um, this thing's three feet in diameter. It's a little large to put in my living room, but it does hang in my workshop, and uh, it does run. And it gave me an interest in building these things. Well, there's nothing special in terms of building them. Once you wrap your mind around them, they're actually uh, quite easy to design. This one was a little complicated to do for first one, so instead we're going to use my second ticker as the example that we'll build today. This is Scimitar, and this is the one that we'll be using. Um, the plans for Scimitar, including the drawings and the G-code tap files and so on, will be available uh, at a uh, web address that I'll post at the end of this video. Everything will be made public domain so that people who wish to make a copy of Scimitar can. My hope, though, is that people will begin to understand how these things are designed so that they can begin to design them themselves. Uh, we would ask anybody that builds one or anything similar just uh, post it on the GearHeads forum so that we can all take a look at it. We're going to go right through the building of Scimitar from beginning to end so that everyone can get an idea. You won't really know, need to know how to design the parts that Gearotic Thoughts design. Um, those will be posted uh, as public domain uh, again on the website. But we're going to go through it right from the beginning to the end and through the CAD portion of it as well so that everyone can get an idea of exactly how they're built. And again, all the files for Scimitar itself uh, will be available uh, at the end of the video. One other thing that needs to be said before we start to build Simtar is I am not a craftsman. This is not going to be a Norm Abrams type of video of come into my shop and I'm going to show you all the proper ways of doing things. I'm a computer programmer. I do woodwork as a hobby. I've been doing it for four or five years and I can build some things. I do use some specialized tools that you don't necessarily have to use. I have a CNC table, for example. But for the most part, you could replace that with a scroll saw and do just as good a work, just slower. Same thing with a laser. Um, anything that the laser can cut, a scroll saw could. So this is Simtar. We got, uh, what, five or six pieces of wood, a few bearings, a few pieces of brass. And that's pretty much it. It's surprisingly simple. Um, can be made in one day without much problem if you have CNC equipment. If you're going with a scroll saw, I would suspect it's a two or three day job because there is some uh, complicated shapes, but nothing overarchingly difficult. And certainly I think everyone out there watching this video who does anything with wood is certainly capable of making one of these beasts. So let's take a look at how it was designed from the start so you'll understand where all the numbers came from. So this is the ratchet screen in uh, Gearotic Thoughts, and here on this screen you can adjust a lot of parameters uh, to get various types of ratchets. We're on the um, Chrono Recoil ratchet at the moment, which is what Scimitar uses, but I'm going to show you a Chrono Deadbeat uh, because it helps better helps to uh, explain uh, how a chrono escapement works. And this is the big mystery for most people, is how do you get this randomly inverting motion, so to speak? This is the largest part of it. If we hit simulate on this, you can see we have several things. First, we have the ratchet. That's this large gear in the middle. And then we have a trigger arm. That's this arm which gets toggled out of the way at times. We have a tooth lock, which is this little curved area down here that the tooth comes to sit on. And we have an impulse pallet, which is this cutout part that the tooth can push on when it does get activated. And we have this pin. Now this pin, when it swings forward and hits and tries to bend this small wire around that small radius, can't do it, so it pushes the arm out of the way. That releases the tooth, tooth swings forward, pushes on the pallet, and adds energy to whatever system you have here. When the pin comes in the other direction, it simply flicks a spring out of the way. The torque is so huge at this point from the pin to the uh, edge of the spring because the root of the spring is so far away that the pendulum really feels nothing by flicking the spring out of the way. This is a very efficient method of transferring energy to a pendulum. 
So here in Erotic, we can select various factors such as the size of the um, impulse palette uh, as a ratio of the main palette. So you can change all kinds of features in order to make something fit a design that you're thinking of. Let's take the standard one that we have here and I'm going to say add it to the project. Here we can see in three dimensions a little better how things work. We have a ratchet. We have a tooth holding that ratchet from spinning. The tooth is held by an arm. The arm is pointing directly at a pallet. It's therefore controlled by this pin. When the pin swings past this little very hard to see spring, it will flick it out of the way. If it's coming in the other direction, it will flick the lever out of the way. If the lever gets flicked out of the way, the ratchet is free to spin. If the ratchet is free to spin and the pallet happens to be at the right spot, the ratchet will snap forward. If for whatever reason this system fails, the arm breaks, uh, the tooth, tooth lock flies off, then usually this pallet, the round part here will be between the teeth in this position and what would happen is the teeth would come forward hit the pallet and everything would break this is a safety lock to ensure that your device doesn't end up spinning down at high speed if something breaks now normally this impulse pallet would have a circular slot cut out of it equal to the distance between two teeth However, I made it fairly large because I had planned on Simtar being wound by simply having a handle on this uh, escapement ratchet and rotating it. Because one interesting point of a chrono escapement is it is also a ratchet. If you were to revolve this pallet around so this cutout was between these two teeth, you would be able to just rotate the pallet in this direction, or rotate the ratchet in clockwise, because as each tooth comes up, it would push that trigger lock out of the way and it would then snap back to lock if it came back. So it is both an escapement and a ratchet uh, at the same time. Now, I wanted to have so many cycles um, of Simtar when it was moving because obviously you don't want to wind it up too, too often, so you like to get a little bit of time out of it. So I was shooting for about a half an hour. Now, the proper thing to do at that point would be to calculate out the mass of your pendulum, how long it's going to take to swing, and then from there you could devise a weight train. But that sounded like a lot of work. So what I did is I bet myself that I could get about 10 seconds. Having come up with that target of 10 seconds, I was going to put a couple gears on this to gear it down. So I'll go to the circular tab, and I went with a 10 tooth to a 40 tooth gear, eh, roughly. So what I did is I added the 10 tooth pinion to the uh, ratchet to the ratchet gear, and then simply went back and added a 40 pin to that. And I put it down um, at a slight angle uh, to the ratchet just to keep things out of the way so I didn't have to worry about a shaft here interfering or a shaft here. Um, what I could have done would be to make this large gear a slight bit smaller and match the shaft onto this shaft or onto this shaft. It would have actually made the device a little smaller, but I also knew that Simtar was going to be an example, so I wanted people to see what was in it. So let's put, in this case, our gear down at around 220 degrees. Okay, so there is our mechanism. That is the only part of Simtar that had to be designed in Gearotic. Uh, I then used Gearotic to put out the um, G-code for each of the gears for the ratchet including the uh, trigger pallet and the chrono lock. The only ones that you really need to do are the two gears, the ratchet and the trigger lock. These are specific shapes that are specific lengths and have specific centers that you really should use those shapes certainly as your starting points.
Uh, everything else is kind of unimportant. The spring, obviously, you're not going to cut a spring. We'll deal with that separately as an issue. These two pallets also, you should not bother cutting. The reason is that Gearotic puts out perfect numbers. That is to say, it puts out an impulse shaft, an impulse pallet with a lock face, which exactly is the right size for locking this ratchet. But in reality, when you build something out of wood, you get sag, you get swell, you get expansion. So this impulse pallet is going to be too large. Now you can cut it, I did. I actually cut mine out of uh, Purple Heart. Uh, I then just took it to a sander and sanded off about two millimeters all the way around. And that brought me down to a proper spec where it would work. I might point out that much of this is not high tolerance. Although you would think that with a device that's going to tick for a couple hours on your wall, tolerances would be incredibly important. Uh, they just aren't. You can deal with these pretty easily and as you're building it you can correct and improvise and come up with wholly different methods of doing things as i said building tickers is a thought process not a, a procedure once you get your head around how everything works you're going to find that having the numbers generated for these centers for the ratchet and so on are very important but after that you've got great freedom to do whatever you want so, I used uh, Gearotic to generate the G-code for the ratchet, the two gears, and this arm. Um, that's all you really needed. But the most important thing was, if you go to the DXF page, there's a shafting DXF that you can put out. Let's put one out and take a look at it, because we'll go through the same process. I'm just going to name this uh, Tutorial. And that's it. It says the positions file output is complete. And now I can just open up that uh, positions file. Okay, so I've loaded the um, positions file DXF into my favorite CAD program, which happens to be uh, VCarve Pro. Um, you can use any CAD program for this, obviously. Uh, but this is what you see what um, Gearotic put out, and it's very handy. From here, you can design an entire device and I'll show you how I went about it. You can see that all of the, all of the uh, parts are on the screen with crosshairs at all the center locations. Well, first off, I know that I forgot to set uh, backlash uh, in the program just now when we created this. I didn't set any backlash between this large gear and the small gear. Uh, normally in Garotic you would thin the teeth, tell to use slightly thinner teeth and that would give you some backlash using a standard shaft distance. I neglected to do that so the first thing I'm going to do is um, select the parts of uh, that gear, all of them, and then I'm just going to move it one millimeter out of the way for backlash purposes and put everything back to normal. Uh, you will want to worry about backlash a little bit but not terribly. Because you're on the weight side of the gear train you don't really need to concern yourself too much with binding. Um, because you're on the weight side is not as important. In a clock when you're on the other side of the escapement friction and um, so on becomes extremely important but on the weight side you uh, you always lower your um, worry level on that so here we have everything that we need to design a device um, let's take our center locations which in this case are all the crosshairs I'm just going to uh, select all of these in the program and I'm gonna copy them paste them and move them away. So now I have several crosshairs um, showing me where all my um, shaft locations are. Now it gets kind of interesting. You have to make a determination of um, what kind of shafts you're going to use for all these things. I use uh, quarter-inch bearings that are flanged. I buy them on eBay by the lot, so um, I find those handy. What kind of bearings you're going to use uh, is up to you and will determine how you're going to do the next step. What I need to do next is create a wall plate in order to hold all these components, the piece that we're going to bolt to the wall.
Now, a smart designer at this point would figure out what the weight uh, is going to be on the uh, weight gear over here, how much we're going to hang from that because that'll set the stress. And from there, you could figure out all the tolerances of uh, how strong this shaft is going to have to be and so on. But yeah, that sounds like a lot of work. So instead, what we're going to do here and what I did was I simply drew um, shaft holes to go in. Now, I use quarter-inch brass shaft. I do that because I can pick up a cheap piece of quarter-inch brass shaft from Home Depot, which is near my house. Uh, that makes it very easily, uh, very easy. So, what I do is I set six millimeter holes. This means that I'm going to have a hole which is uh, just large enough to accept a quarter-inch brass shaft uh, very tightly. I'll have to hammer it into the hole to get it to work. So, now that I've got my holes, um, it's a question of what do I want my back plate to look like. Now again, here you can consider all the uh, stresses involved and how heavy your central uh, vein is going to be. Um, I never do that. I just draw a bunch of uh, circles, like this for example. Uh, and then I'll move the circle around until it encompasses two centers on a shaft. If I'm lucky, it might even hit three centers. That's fine, too. And then I'll draw another circle, and I'll try to intersect it uh, with another couple of centers. And once I do this enough, I'll end up with a shape um, that is close to what I want. In your CAD program, if you use an offset utility uh, and start to offset these these circles, you'll soon find yourself drawing a frame. Now around each shaft, I will surround it with a boss, and I'll usually uh, do a boss to a an even number of centimeters, say three centimeters in this particular case, and Vectric makes it pretty easy for me to uh, make 30 mil circles around everything. If we then begin to offset things, I'll go 10 millimeters on the side and begin to offset some of these circles inside and outside. And once you do enough of these circles and you're offsetting things in and out and so on, uh, I just take my pair of scissors and I begin to clip away parts that I don't wish to have. Um, I might even keep that one. And once I'm finished with all my scissors and so on, as you can see, I have a skeleton that I can now use for my back plane. Now, there was, there is one other thing that um, you have to consider when you're doing your back plane. This trigger arm is um, unsupported. It needs, although it's supported on its bearing shaft, it needs to be spring driven and it needs to have a stop when it comes in to stop it from coming too far. Now that stop will always be um, directly on a line between the trigger bars bearing and the pallets bearing. So what I do is I draw a straight line between those two shaft positions. And anywhere on that line, we're going to need another six millimeter hole for a brass rod to go there to hold it. This will make sense to you later on when you see it. So what I do is just set myself up for a six millimeter hole. I draw the hole, zoom in and move it so that the brass rod will just touch the edge of that center line. I can then remove that line that I guided it for, set myself to a 30 millimeter boss that I've been using, give myself a line like that. And for that one, I'll just draw a line between uh, two of these centers. Every time I do this, I end up with a, a different background. Uh, but your clipping scissors in a CAD program, and most CAD programs I've seen have them, uh, will allow you to do some pretty good backgrounds. And as you can see, you just kind of run through and uh, delete everything that's in your way, and you will end up with a, uh, a back piece. Now, I cut these out of uh, quarter-inch Baltic birch because cutting them out of real wood is usually problematic when you're creating a frame. You'll find that you cannot get one piece of wood. You could buy a 1 by 12 piece of hardwood, but it's never a good idea. It will warp on you. Plywood is the best thing to use for a back plate.
and quarter inch uh sorry half inch baltic birch is uh, my preferred uh, stuff it's very easy to deal with anyway once you have uh, made your back plate and i'm just going to clean this up for a moment okay so once all the uh, scissors have cleaned up all the extraneous lines you're left with what looks like a nice skeleton now on mine i will add a uh, perhaps a boss here a uh, hole for a screw to go into and then maybe a smaller hole for a, a slot for that screw you get the point and if you use CAD I'm sure that you're used to doing such things with that now once I build something like that I now know I have to generate g-code for that with my CAM program because again I use g-code if you were using a scroll saw or whatever you could simply just uh, print that out of course but I'm gonna group that now copy it and paste it and the reason I do that is I always take one copy and put it back down onto the master um, drawing and line up my centers so that I always have an overall drawing of everything that's going to be in the project I can always reach in and grab it out if I need to but I set the parts to the side uh, that I'm going to need to cut so there is my background for example and then I can begin to design more and more parts that are going to um, fit that I'm going to have to cut in order to make this project work now a few things I think need to be said um, about shafting for example because each one of these shaft holes may be quite different my plan was to put both the gears the weight wheel because a weight wheel also always needs a pulley of some sort in order to hang a weight on um, the um, all of the ratchet and the gears that drive it and so on were all going to be on bearings um, but bearings on a shaft I'm planting the shaft directly into the wood in the case of the uh, weight gear the ratchet wheel which is up here um, the trigger arm also uh, the trigger lock but one gear is going to need a larger bearing because my plan was to sink the bearing into the wood because I'm going to need super high support for this main wheel which is our veins so because of that I have uh, bearings which are almost 16 millimeters in size so I made a special hole for those on mine and you're going to see that in the plans uh, for the captive bearings so I'm going to switch now to the actual project. Every time I do this, I end up with different shapes and different types of bases. That's actually not a bad looking base. It looks kind of like a fish. But every time I do it, I end up with something totally different. So now I'm going to switch to the actual Simtar drawings um, so that we can take a look at what we've got. Okay, this is what you get once you uh, load the Simtar project from the shaft locations and then design all the parts that uh, are going to be necessary that are extra and this is the DXF drawing that you'll find in the package that you can download if you wish to build Simtar um, I've had a couple questions about how you would go about designing for example uh, the ratchet or extra parts that uh, may not fit remember that all these drawings are to scale so to make a ratchet and that's the only one I'll exemplify here for you uh, to make a ratchet I simply copied my main ratchet copied it over on top of my uh, weight gear and shrunk it down until it was approximately the size that I would want for a um, for a ratchet now the larger you make this the uh, quicker your machine is going to run down uh, I found making it uh, about the size here uh, you get about an hour uh, from a typical five foot or so mounting point now once you have that shape you simply add a circle so that you've got uh, a shaft location for it I can add an outside circle for it as well so that uh, that will be the actual spool in this case I'm going to get Vectric to produce G codes so that this gets machined down to the spool and that gives me about a three inch spool now in order to design the ratchet lock for it though uh, I simply asked for a six millimeter hole inserted it in a nice spot on the gear where I figured I could pound a six millimeter brass uh, little peg into uh, after that it's simply a matter of 
rotating the ratchet to the point that I want it to lock at. In this case, I think I went somewhere around like this. We draw a simple line which is parallel to the teeth on the ratchet. We draw a line upwards. Uh, we do that again from here. Draw a circle around where we're going to pound in our pin. Again, use your scissors. And there you have it. And there's our ratchet. Now, that's the way I do it. Then I go out in the garage and hold it in place so everything looks like it matches up. I mark my hole, drill it, and I'll hook a little spring from the rim of this gear uh, to this edge so it always pulls my ratchet down. That way I just stick this in the machine and I can roll up my string onto here. Uh, my string is connected to a weight, uh, which is going to drive everything. Um, that's another part that we haven't discussed, is the amount of weight that you're going to put on uh, the device to run it. Uh, and that really depends on how good you are at uh, your construction techniques. The um, tighter things run on your device, the more weight you'll have to add. And the heavier that you make these veins, and the more arms that you put on this central pivot, I have three arms and three veins. That usually means you'll need a fair amount more weight uh, to drive them. Uh, just look at it and think the more mass you have, uh, the more weight you're going to need. Uh, you may even want to build this with uh, an arm that simply has two arms or two veins on it directly opposed to each other as opposed to the three that I went for. Maybe I uh, overreached a little bit, but. I'm happy with the end result, so what the heck. Um, also, when you design veins, like this vein, I designed it with several holes in it so I could pound in little pieces of brass to counterweight the vein, because in the end, you want the veins to be able to swivel around from gravity and acceleration as the uh, device moves around. And also, when it comes to a stop position, you want each vein to point in a particular uh, a particular direction so it looks like uh, three knives coming off of a center. You can accomplish all that as long as you uh, make allowances for it. In my case I made little holes that I could pound little quarter inch wedges of brass into and I just place them until everything would balance out. Now before we go on to final construction then let's just talk for a few moments about shafting because that is something that I've also had a lot of questions about how to deal with shafts. So if we just mention one quick thing about shafting, I want you to imagine that this is our half inch plywood set against the wall and here we have a brass uh, six millimeter rod coming out of it. Um, the pressure that's applied on the wood is what you need to worry about. This area here will crush downwards and this area here will crush upwards. And with quite a bit of power, depending on the width of the board. Now, I'm only using half inch plywood to uh, do this holding of the shafts. And this is fine as long as the shaft itself is not holding any weight. But picture our uh, weight wheel, which is basically a large gear, and behind it a ratchet and spool. And on this spool, we have approximately, say, three pounds of weight hanging. That three or four pounds can be quite a bit of leverage on this shaft. And sometimes you're going to need this little bit of space uh, because of uh, the way it interplays with other axles on the, uh, uh, on the machine. So what my trick is, is I try to make sure that this area of wood here is thicker than the half inch and I add a three quarter inch uh, disc of wood with a set screw put into it uh, quite frequently and the reason I do this is because it's dead simple. Uh, I use quarter inch brass rod for a reason and one, uh, for many reasons and one of the reasons is that a hole saw has a quarter inch drill in the middle. So if I simply drill out uh, one inch holes uh, I can take that center, uh, I can take the piece which is cut out, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, here in Canada we'd call that a timbit I guess, uh, 
but we take the one inch slug of wood which comes out of the saw it already has a nice quarter inch hole already going through the center of it uh, so once we drill in on the side of it I hold it against a sander to get a flat side and then I drill into it and I put a set screw and that way I can use an allen key to uh, tighten on the shaft and what I'll do is I'll push the shaft into the wood through the disc through the uh, half inch plywood after having glued the disc I'll set the set shaft and I'll wait three or four hours for that to set uh, and that will give me a total of an inch and a quarter uh, of wood to hold this shaft. The forces that deal with the shaft are always concerned with the actual width of material holding uh, the shaft steady versus the amount of material outside. And I try to shoot for about one third uh, of the shaft typically embedded solidly in wood so that I won't have to worry about uh, the shafts bending. A quarter inch brass shaft will hold one heck of a lot of weight before it bends. Uh, the problem that you'll hit into is almost always the pinching and causing it to, uh, to weaken uh, which makes the shaft bend down wherever it's this way, uh, skews your gear and can make things run badly so always uh, up the power of where the shafts go in by doing something similar. Which brings us back to the beginning where we started. These are the pieces which fit together to do simtar. You'll notice that in the planning stage I really didn't design uh, too much in terms of how thick things are or how to put things together. Uh, that's because it's best to figure that out, I find anyways, at assembly time. I cut all the pieces from whatever I have. Here you'll see I've added brass pins to the small little uh, tin bits that hold the shafts. I also added a triangular piece uh, to support the trigger arm because I wanted it to have um, a bit of um, strength against the pushing of the trigger lock. This is the uh, main shaft. It's the one that has to spin most freely. Uh, you can see that it also has a little uh, trigger pin on top that's going to trigger the device. Underneath it, it has a captive bearing. This is one of the flanged bearings that I use uh, to hold things together. So the total height of it is actually quite tall and uh, provides quite a bit of strength. If you look closely on this one, you'll just see the top of the bearing flange um, is in between the uh, trigger pallets uh, pin pallet and the uh, large knob. Um, I have a flanged bearing at the top and I have the one in the plywood that was uh, shown in a preceding frame and that gives me a very long length, almost uh, two, in, two and a half inches I think of support inside wood which allows me about five or six inches if I follow my approximately one third rule uh, on the other side of that and that's what allows Simtar to hold all the weight of the rotating frame with its veins. Well, just one note on finish. You'll notice how bad the finish looks on this. Um, I washed this plywood with green dye and then washed it with red dye and then slapped shellac wherever I felt like it. And I did that on every piece of Simtar. It actually gives it a um, quite nice appearance when it's all put together and on the wall. But on a cell phone picture on the bench, it looks absolutely terrible. So um, judge that as you will. Anyway, enough said. So here we have our large uh, weight gear, the main gear that holds all the weight. Uh, as you can see, I've got a captive bearing in the top, and I press one into the bottom as well. So this is supported. It's a uh, about a 24 millimeter thick board, I think. One note on all of the thicknesses, I don't plane wood down to size for these types of things. If I was building a clock, I might worry about the thickness of the gears. These things have uh, very um, few gears in them, so there's no sense worrying too much about the uh, thickness of them, for example. I would prefer to simply um, cut whatever I have, and the thicker the better. This project was meant to look like a beefy, rough machine. It wasn't meant to look like a fine, uh, jeweled clock.
you can see on here where I've simply drilled a hole and punched in a brass pin to allow this rocker to toggle on my uh, ratchet. And you can also see I put a little return spring. Springs, by the way, I get from uh, Prince's Auto here in Canada. I bought a, ba a bag of springs for, I think, two bucks. And it includes enough springs to do hundreds of these projects and of different types so you can root through them to find a spring that'll do you. And this is another reason I don't plan beyond cutting all the gears is because in the end you sort of hold these things up, determine what height you want to lock them onto a shaft, and then root through your springs and grab whatever spring will work and hammer in a pin if you figure a pin will work. Uh, being picky is just counterproductive, I think, when you're building this type of thing. And then we have our ratchet, of course, and uh, this one is just, a, again, I think it's around 20 millimeter thick piece of wood, and I told Vectric to machine it down the first six millimeters and then to cut it out. So basically it's got a ratchet formed into it. And I did that so that the ratchet would have strength. Ratchets are always a problem. You can snap their teeth off. Uh, like here at this, uh, on the left-hand side middle, you'll see that that tooth, the grain is running in the direction of the tip. So that tooth could easily snap off. But if you machine them into a board such as this, um, they probably won't snap off. Now, if you're doing all this with a scroll saw or with uh, other tools, you could machine that uh, separately. Just cut it out on a scroll saw from quarter-inch plywood or something similar and just glue it to a uh, round piece of wood that you're going to use as it's pulled. Um, this thing's pretty easy to make. Here it is with the ratchet installed. You can see a hole drilled in it. This is because there's also holes drilled in from the top, and I just loop a string through. The theory is that one string will be wrapped clockwise, one string will be wrapped counterclockwise, one will hold the weight, and the other one you simply pull on or attach to a winder in order to wind up the device. And here we have the main ratchet, the thing that provides all the energy uh, to the device and keeps it running. It's cut from the same piece of wood as the uh, drive gear and drive pinion. Um, what you don't see easily here is the pinion is glued directly underneath uh, the shaft of this, and I have three brass pins that I drove through as well uh, in order to hold it securely. And then we have the the trigger arm. Um, we'll discuss how I got the heights of all these things later, but if you look at the trigger arm, you can see that it's just pressed onto the shaft. Uh, it was a little loose, so I do put a I did put a cigarette paper down on the board before I pressed the bearing in. That's just one trick for tightening up a bearing. Once I did that, it swings quite easily on its shaft. And you can see just at the top of the screen, there was uh, the beginning of this trigger. This red piece uh, that is on the bottom, which is actually the top of the trigger, uh, was designed to uh, trap the ratchet tooth. And you'll notice it has a bolt through it. That allows me to adjust the trigger back and forth and up and down in order to set it uh, well, you can set a hair trigger with it. It's how much of that tooth is going to hook the uh, tooth of the ratchet. You'll also notice this clothespin like looking spring. I found that in the bag of springs from uh, that I had picked up. And uh, I added a little eighth inch uh, brass shaft to hold that spring. And that top part of the spring is simply going to hook over the shafts that we talked about at the beginning of this video uh, that keeps the arm from going in too far. Uh, so the arm which is uh, that we added to the support frame at the beginning is now doing a dual job. It not only stops the lever from going in too far, but it also um, controls the spring that pulls the lever back into itself. Also, if you look just to the right of the post, which is holding the spring, you'll notice there's a little piece of walnut board. It's only about uh, 3 uh, slice of a walnut board that I've got two screws through. And that's what's holding this gold spring, as it's referred to. And just at the very extreme right of the screen, you'll see two little white pieces of plastic popping out of it. Uh, this is actually just two, pick, uh, two tie wraps that are cut off and wrapped in black electrical tape. They comprise my uh, spring action. And here's that spring pointing at the uh, actual trigger that's going to trip it. Now this is the actual uh, 
power of this machine. This is the working mechanism. You can see the main shaft is free to spin. There's nothing stopping it. It's on. If it's on good bearings, you'll get really nice spins out of it. But as this little brass rod comes around and flicks those two tie wraps wrapped in electrical tape in one direction, it knocks the uh, spring out of the way, and in the other direction, it will push the arm out of the way. You'll notice, too, that the arm looks almost like it went through a pencil sharpener. Uh, this is because I take most of my pieces and run it through a router. Take a look at the frame portion down at the bottom. Uh, you'll notice the tops are all rounded. This is just to get rid of that sharp, contrasty line uh, so that those pieces won't draw the eye. For the um, trigger arm, I ran it through the router and it chipped off sections. Well, that's no problem. Uh, recutting it sounded like a lot of work. So I just went to the sander and rotated it as if it was a pencil and tidied it up until it was a nice looking shape. Uh, as you can see, it looks uh, quite comfortable here as a, a triggering mechanism in one direction only. So here you can see the tooth on the arm being uh, holding the tooth on the ratchet. This is what, how much tooth uh, is holding when the ratchet is bottomed out and uh, and the arm is pointing straight at the trigger lock. Uh, it's not much tooth. It doesn't have to swing out of the way too much for everything to trigger. So this is the calibration position of the machine. When you have it all put together, this is the position as it's about to trigger. The triggering position in this particular case is clockwise. Look what happens to the pin as it turns clockwise. It's going to push on the spring. The gold spring is going to push on the arm. The arm yeah, up at the top is going to release the tooth on the ratchet and the tooth on the ratchet is going to come down and smack into that purple piece of uh, purple heart which is going to rotate the shaft. That piece of purple heart has a set screw which will attach it firmly to the shaft and the piece with the pin on it is a separate piece which is also uh, got a uh, set screw to attach it to the shaft. Both of them are adjustable because it's a very dynamic process and as you change weight on the vein system you will have to readjust to make sure that the tooth on the ratchet impacts the um, purple heart piece here, the impulse pallet at just the right time. So sometimes there will be a wide variation in where you'll have to set them in relation to one another to get the pin to properly hit. But with hit and miss, uh, you can really find it in uh, no time. Just playing with it for 10 or 15 minutes when you've got it built to this stage and you'll quickly find sweet zones uh, for how to set these things. Watch the uh, slow motion video of the actual trigger process. Our pin pushes our tooth up ratchet hits and pushes. This is why you don't want to have too much too much weight. Watch the stress closely. Wham! And another whap onto the trigger. Provides quite a bit of energy to the pendulum, but it's not something that you want to do with way too much weight uh, unless you're willing to have things snap off and break. And that brings us to the final question. How long do I make the shafts? How do I know where to put these things? Well, I simply looked at it pragmatically. The closest thing I wanted to the wall was the weight wheel. Um, when you have weight hanging off of a shaft, the closer that weight is to its support, the less bending and stress you'll have on the shaft. So you notice that the weight wheel to the hard uh, left of this picture, underneath the main large gear, uh, that's pretty close to the wall. So first thing I did was stick a shaft in that hole, set it using its set screw, and then I uh, just slit the brass rod to take a C-clip and I set that gear down on it and then uh, marked the top of the shaft and put a C-clip on that so that that shaft was locked and that gear was set in place. That gear then decided all the rest. Once that main weight gear was attached, then it was a simple matter of uh, attaching the central ratchet gear. Since the two had to mesh, I simply picked a little bit of an offset. And again, once you lock in the shaft with your set screw, it's pretty easy to measure what height you want. And then slit the shafts appropriately and stick a quick C-clip on them. So that's about it. Have to get it all put together, stick it up, and uh, let it run on just its arms. I won't bother going into how to make the veins. I suspect all of you who will end up building this will make your own veins. But this is basically how it should tick for you uh, when you just hang it from a bench and give it a spin. Uh, 
you'll find it pretty easy to tune and a lot of fun to build. If you like this uh, video, let us know. Uh, just hit like after watching the video, and if we get enough likes, I'll consider doing one on the bat. The bat's actually a lot easier to build, um, uh, although a bit more complex to understand until you've at least built something like Scimitar. So that's it. Thank you for watching. Uh, there will be information posted in a second as to the website to go to. You can download these project files and uh, build the device. Uh, we're happy to see anyone. Um, hope you enjoyed it.